A woman mysteriously disappeared from her own home and her friends decided to go to the police. At first it looked as if she herself had gone somewhere, but with each new clue, the case became more and more creepy. Eventually, investigators were able to uncover the mystery and the truth turned out to be quite frightening. Mindy Schloss was born in 1955 in New York City. When she was 25, she moved to Alaska where she graduated from a local medical university. The woman earned a degree in psychiatry and took a job as a nurse at Fairbanks Hospital, though most of the time she had to work on the field. Many people in remote areas of Alaska were not able to go to the hospital on their own, so Mindy and her colleagues would use all manner of transportation, including boats and airplanes, to get to them. She loved her job and took it as seriously as she could. Mindy lived about 600 kilometers from the hospital in Anchorage. She took a plane to work and stayed in a hotel all weekdays, going home on weekends. It was August 2007. Mindy, who was 52 years old at the time, returned to Anchorage for the weekend and was soon to fly back to work. During her absence, she always asked her best friend, Jerry, to stop by her house to feed her cat and give him the medicine he needed. On Saturday, August 4th, her friend called her to discuss the matter, but Mindy never came to the phone. She still hadn't been able to reach her all day, and it was strange. So Jerry contacted their mutual friend, but he too had not called Mindy that day. At first, Jerry thought Mindy had gone somewhere on business, but she didn't answer her phone the next day either. Then her friend decided to drive to her house. No one answered the door knock either, and Jerry used her spare key. At first glance, everything seemed normal. The house was in order, there were no signs of a struggle or any other evidence that something bad had happened to Mindy. It was only on the way out that Jerry noticed something strange. The doorknob of the front door was loose, and the woman decided to tighten the screws with a screwdriver. After that she went to work without knowing where her friend had disappeared to. On Monday, August 6th, Jerry called the hospital where Mindy worked. To her surprise, the woman never showed up for work, which was completely out of character for her. Nor did she contact any of her co-workers to alert them of her absence. All this indicated that something might have happened to the woman and Jerry decided to contact the police. The police department took a missing persons report and Jerry and the detective went to Mindy's house again. No sign of a break-in was found. There was also nothing of value missing from the house. This ruled out the possibility that a burglar had broken into the woman's home. What's more, Mindy had some medications in her home that were only available with a doctor's prescription. Any burglar would most likely have taken them since they were in demand among people with drug addictions. Upon entering the garage, they discovered that Mindy's car was missing. It was also very strange. The woman always took a cab to the airport and only used her car to get around town. The police concluded that something really bad had happened to the woman. A forensic team examined the house, trying to find any clues, but it was inconclusive. At the time, the kidnapping theory was unlikely. The police thought Mindy might have probably had an accident. She often went to the countryside and the terrain in those parts was quite dangerous. People could have fallen prey to wild animals or just accidentally fallen off a cliff. But this theory did not bring the police any closer. To solving the case, and they decided to begin a search for suspects who, in theory, could have been involved in her disappearance. The first thing they did was check on Bob, Mindy, and Jerry's mutual friend. The men were eager to cooperate with the investigation, and the detectives quickly determined that on the day of the woman's disappearance, he was at work, many miles away from her home. The police had no clear answer. The woman had not been in touch since Saturday. After examining her computer, experts determined that the last time she used it was at 1.30 a.m. that same day. With no solid leads, police decided to enlist the help of the public. They posted flyers around town with information about the missing woman and distributed the information to local TV stations. The same day, they began receiving calls from witnesses, but most of the leads led nowhere. People reported seeing Mindy in various places and even in other states. None of these leads were ever helpful. Meanwhile, Bob and his co-workers decided to comb the area where Mindy might have gone. She had been out in the countryside quite often for berries or just out for a walk. Unfortunately, the search also yielded no results. 
The detectives decided to go a different route and contacted the bank the woman used. They asked them to check to see if there had been any activity on her cards in recent days, and this is where a serious lead finally awaited them. Early Sunday morning, the day after Mindy went missing, someone had withdrawn $500 from her debit card, the maximum amount available for withdrawing in a 24-hour period. Police immediately obtained the ATM camera footage from the bank, and they got a disturbing sighting. It turned out that the money had been withdrawn by an unknown man. His face was covered by a bandana, so they could not identify him. He pulled down the bandana only after his face was out of the camera's field of view. As a result, the police had no choice but to wait until the man tried to use someone else's card again. Meanwhile, the detectives received another tip. They learned from Mindy's co-workers that the woman was planning to renovate her home and had hired workers. At some point, she had a conflict with their supervisor over the cost of the work. Mindy later admitted to her co-workers that she was afraid of him because he acted strangely during visits to her home. The police checked on the man, but he turned out to have an alibi for the day the woman they also questioned another worker who came to her house on Friday around 7 p.m. The man was also uninvolved and he couldn't remember anything suspicious that night. It wasn't long before detectives had a new lead. Bank security reported that Mindy's card had been charged $500 again in the early morning hours, but this time from a different ATM. After studying the security footage, the police immediately realized it was the same man as the first time. But there was something odd on the tape. The man withdrew the money and left, but returned to the ATM a few seconds later. He walked around it for a while, pushing buttons and eventually left again. After calling the bank, detectives found out the reason for his strange behavior. The unknown person forgot to take the card out and the ATM then takes it away to prevent the theft. The real owner can get it back by going to the bank with his ID. Of course, this was not an option for the criminal, so he lost access to Minnie's account forever. This time, the police managed to find a witness. He drove up to the very same ATM when an unidentified man came out of there. According to the witness, he got on his bicycle and rode away. It was a significant lead since most people were traveling by car or on foot, but all that information was still not enough to get any closer to a clue and detectives decided to interview everyone in the Mindy area. They asked people to recall any oddity or to point them to neighbors who were suspicious. To their surprise, many residents named one particular house right near Mindy's house. According to them, parties were constantly held there. The residents were always making noise and disturbing the peace. The detectives went there and found out that quite a number of people were living there, but they weren't willing to talk to the police. The detectives then went to a woman who lived directly across the street from the house. She said she did not see anything suspicious, but her demeanor showed that she was very nervous. The next day, the woman called the police station and asked the detectives to meet, but not at her house. They met at another location and the woman shared a creepy story. Shortly before the detective's first visit, a man who lived across the street had stopped by to see her. He said police were walking around the neighborhood and asked the woman not to tell them he lived here. When asked why he said he was on parole, and did not want the police to know his location. At night, the woman heard someone walking on the porch of her house. She looked out the window and saw that it was the same man. He stomped around, looked in several windows and left. The woman was greatly frightened and decided to tell the police about it. Detectives learned his name was Josh Wayne, who was 27 years old at the time. After running him through the database, they found out that the guy had been convicted of murder seven years earlier. At the time, he was accused of beating a woman to death, but a jury acquitted him. As a result, Josh was accused of tampering with evidence and sentenced to six and a half years in prison. After spending three years behind bars, he was released early. Detectives immediately identified him as a prime suspect. After talking to his housemates, they found out that Josh didn't have a car and that he got around mainly by bicycle. But there was just one problem. When police began looking for him, the man had disappeared without a trace. On Thursday, August 9th, police suddenly had another lead. A local trucker called them and said he had spotted Mindy's car in a parking lot near the airport. He had seen its picture in the newspaper and immediately recognized the car. 
Detectives arrived on the scene and confirmed that the car was indeed Mindy's. They also noticed that a surveillance camera was pointed at the parking lot from a nearby building and requested a recording. It showed a man driving this car into the parking lot at 12.30 p.m. on August 4th. Getting out and wiping down the door handle apparently, he was wiping off his fingerprints. Unfortunately, the quality of the recording did not allow his face to be seen. CSI examined the car for prints or traces of DNA and were able to recover some samples. However, it took time to study them and there was no guarantee it would be useful in the case. On the passenger seat was Mindy's purse, which could indicate that the woman had been in the car with the perpetrator, alive or dead. Not getting the results they wanted from using modern analysis tools, the detectives decided to use search dogs. Few believed this idea would succeed since it had been a week since Mindy had disappeared. But for lack of other options, they still turned to film dogs. The service dog was taken to the ATMs from which the unknown man had withdrawn money, as well as Mindy's car. The dog picked up the trail and headed down the street toward the woman's house, located three blocks from that location. After sniffing the front door, she went straight to the very house where Josh Wayne had previously lived. The detectives, who until recently had not believed in the search dog idea, were shocked. The service dog directly pointed them to the fact that Josh was in Mindy's car, near her house and near those ATMs. The next day the police repeated the experiment with another search dog. The result was the same. The dogs walked the entire distance and stopped at Josh's house. Though it was not an unqualified piece of evidence that would work in court, the detectives decided not to waste their time and obtained a warrant for the suspect's arrest. They went to his house, but the man hadn't been there in days. After searching the building, they found the same jacket that the unidentified man had been wearing on the cameras near the ATMs and in the pocket was a cash withdrawal slip from Mindy's card. Next, they discovered a woman's gold watch and immediately showed it to Jerry. The woman confirmed that the watch belonged to Mindy. The experts were able to compare the DNA samples found on the steering wheel of Mindy's car samples from items from his home and they matched. This indicated that Josh had been in the missing woman's car. This evidence was already much more serious and the police were focused on catching the suspect. Leaflets with his name were posted all over the city and they even rented several billboards. According to detectives, it was one of the largest manhunt operations in Alaskan history. Virtually every law enforcement officer was working on the matter, and locals reported any suspicious evidence. At one point, police released ATM camera photos and were approached almost immediately by a woman named Lisa. She said she had met Josh before and was sure he was the one in the photo. The important thing here is that the police did not name the main suspect, but what followed was the turning point in the case. Another acquaintance of Josh's came to the police with a confession. For the past week she had been helping him get around town by transporting him in her car. One day he left his backpack in the back seat and the young woman and her mother looked inside. There they found several more ATM receipts as well as a phone. In the gallery they found a photo in which Josh was supposedly holding a gun in his hand. For the police this information only added to the alarm. Detectives already feared that the suspect might attack someone else while they were looking for him. And thanks to his phone, they found out that he was also armed. The cops tried to convince his girlfriend to help them catch Josh. They wanted the young woman to take a tape recorder with her and go to meet him, where they would try to get him to talk about what he had done to Mindy. But the young woman was too scared and refused. Soon, however, she had to participate against her own will. On September 2nd, Josh came to her house and in an aggressive manner began demanding her backpack. Given that the young woman gave it to the police, she had to come up with an excuse on the fly. Realizing she didn't have the backpack, Josh asked her to take him somewhere far away from here to hide from the police, but the young woman refused. She offered to let him stay at her house, but Josh suspected something was wrong and left. The young woman realized that she would not be safe until the police caught the man. So she decided to follow him discreetly in her car, calling the detectives along the way. At some point, Josh reached his acquaintance's house and went inside. By that time, the police, SWAT, and FBI had already begun to converge on the scene. Everyone feared that the suspect would not surrender without a fight and those fears proved to be true. 
Using weapons, Josh took two people who were in the house with him hostage. A lawyer was invited to negotiate with him, who after several hours managed to convince him to surrender. During the interrogation, he hardly spoke to the police, but the investigators were in no hurry to accuse him of killing Mindy. At that point, they already thought the woman was probably dead, but without her body, it would have been extremely difficult to prove it. So Josh was only charged with stealing Mindy's bank card and watch. The FBI agent decided to get crafty. He listed the charges to Josh and he said they were all lies. The investigator then stated that they had evidence that he was the one who withdrew the money from someone else's card. And Mindy herself had gone to the police to report the card theft. Upon hearing this, the suspect grinned and asked what games they were trying to play with him. From this reaction, the FBI agent was finally convinced that Josh had killed Mindy, but the police still had to find her body in order to charge Josh with murder. They had to work against the weather, it was snowing early in that area, and they would have no chance of finding Mindy. If her remains got snowed in. On September 13, police received a call from an electrician working near the town of Wasilla, about a hundred miles from Anchorage. He spotted the body of a woman in a wooded area and immediately thought it was Mindy, and experts from the lab confirmed it. The deceased was indeed Mindy Schloss. The medical examination revealed that the woman had been shot in the back of the head and her remains had been disposed of by fire. After the bullet was recovered, it was determined that it had been fired from the very weapon with which Josh had been apprehended. All the police had to do now was to figure out how the events that led to Minnie's death unfolded. Meanwhile, the experts continued to examine every millimeter of her house, trying to find any trace of Josh's presence. It was extremely difficult to do so. They had to collect virtually every hair from the floor of Mindy's house and then examine it in the lab. It took months, but eventually they were able to find a hair that belonged to Josh. This was confirmed by DNA testing and the detectives now had proof in hand of the suspect's presence in the victim's home. On May 18, 2008, ten months after the murder, he was finally charged and brought to trial. While gathering witnesses to testify against Josh, an interesting situation occurred. His ex-girlfriend, Lisa, who had identified him from a photo near an ATM, refused to testify in court. She regularly visited her ex-boyfriend in prison, and at one point, the couple announced their intention to marry. Investigators were shocked by this turn of events, but they quickly realized what was behind the move. The U.S. Constitution allows relatives not to testify against each other, and in all likelihood, Josh convinced Lisa to marry him for these reasons. There was one problem, though. Soon after the marriage was consummated, it was declared null and void because state law prohibited weddings with inmates. But the detectives wondered why Josh was so intent on shielding Lisa from questioning and testifying. Was it really all about some pictures outside an ATM where you couldn't even see his face? Most likely the young woman knew a lot more. Investigators tried to get her to talk, but at first they did not succeed. However, at some point, Lisa herself contacted them and said that Josh confessed to her about the murder during one of her visits to the prison. According to his story, there was a party at his house Friday night. Josh, who had no means of livelihood, decided to sneak into the house next door and steal something. That house turned out to be Mindy's place. Josh opened the door of the house and began to search the house for valuables. At one point, Mindy walked into the room, and he immediately realized that if he let her live now, he wouldn't be able to avoid jail. He didn't want to go there again, so he grabbed the woman, took her to the bathroom, and tied her hands. The perpetrator then went to his house to get a gun, taking some handy things to kidnap her with. Before returning to Mindy's house, he put bags of her legs and secured them with duct tape, so as not to leave any trace. He then took the woman to the garage, put her in his own car, and drove out of town. After an hour of driving, he stopped in a wooded area and drove Mindy away from the road. Where he killed her. Josh then returned to her house, cleaned, vacuumed the carpet, and left. The trial did not begin until the spring of 2009. The prosecution had offered Josh a deal. He would confess to killing Mindy and another woman seven years earlier in exchange for waiving the death penalty. This way, the authorities hoped to close two high-profile cases at once, and Josh agreed. As a result, he was sentenced to 99 years in prison without parole. 
During the reading of the sentence, Josh cried, but at one point things heated up. When the judge called him a coward for taking the lives of two women, the criminal jumped up and shouted, what about the men I killed? At this point, his lawyers grabbed him and silenced him before he could say anything else. That shouting kept the detectives busy. For five long years until, in 2014, Josh himself offered authorities a new deal. He agreed to confess to the murders of three men if he was transferred from a local prison to a federal prison. Apparently, the conditions there were much higher. Considering that the criminal's request was insignificant, the authorities agreed. Josh said he killed one man in Anchorage in 1994 when he was only 14 years old. He committed the next murder in 1999, and he killed the third man a year later, the same day he massacred the woman. The first two men have been identified, but the identity of the third is still a mystery. Investigators have no doubt that Josh was indeed involved in the murders. They are more concerned about another question, whether there are no other crimes under his belt, about which he is silent. In any case, the police have managed to permanently isolate him from society and prevent other murders that would surely have followed. Share your opinion on this story in the comments and don't forget to like it and subscribe. The 15-year-old young woman went out for a walk, promising her parents she would be back soon, but she never came home and her phone was turned off. The parents contacted the police, who began a search for the missing young woman. Detectives had no leads until they gained access to her Facebook account. It was there that the eerie clue as to what had happened to her lurked. Nicole Cable was born on August 12, 1997, in the small American town of Glenburn, Maine. Her parents divorced when she was young and the young woman was left to live with her mother, stepfather and three younger sisters. During her high school years, Nicole had a passion for music, was on the cheerleading team and even modeled for a local company. She also had many friends who described the young woman as cheerful, helpful and kind. She always tried to keep a positive outlook on life, even though she, like many teenagers, had her own difficulties. In the spring of 2013, when the young woman was 15 years old, she was looking forward to the approaching school vacations and her birthday. Only a few months separated her from getting the driver's license she had dreamed of for so long. Nicole lived in a tiny town where there was practically nothing but a few apartment buildings. Were larger communities where almost all of her friends lived and there were many more distractions. Even her school was a 20-minute drive from home and she had to wait for the bus every morning. On Sunday evening, May 12th, Nicole told her parents that she was going to meet a friend and would be back soon. She left the house at about 9 p.m. and headed along the main road, but she never returned home. Concerned parents tried to call her, but her phone was turned off and she hadn't logged on to social media. When they contacted her friends, they learned that none of them had seen Nicole that night. After waiting until morning, her mother decided to go to the police. She had hoped to the last that Nicole had simply stayed the night at her friend's house, even though that raised serious questions. First of all, the young woman had never left home all night without her parents' permission. She would certainly have contacted her mother and told her where she was. The police immediately began a search. At first stages, they refused to stick to any one version. Investigators admitted that the young woman could have left home of her own free will, but they also did not rule out a criminal element. The first day of searching brought no results. Police interviewed friends and relatives of the young woman and began searching for her in the Glenburn area. To report their daughter missing and urge the public to help find her. That same day, her friends printed and posted hundreds of flyers both inside and outside Glenburn. Police asked for volunteers to stay away from the area to avoid having service dogs pick up her trail. On the second day, the police held a press conference where Nicole's mother made an appeal. With tears in her eyes, she asked her daughter to return home if she ran away of her own free will. The mother also spoke out about a possible kidnapping and urged those responsible to let Nicole go if someone was holding her. The head of the local police added that the search operation would be expanded. The FBI and state police became involved, bringing the total number of officers involved to 45. The public soon learned one disturbing fact. Nicole's mother revealed that her daughter had been texting with a certain guy on Facebook for weeks. Police accessed Nicole's account and discovered that this young man was Brian Butterfield. 
Moreover, based on the correspondence on the day of her disappearance, the young woman had arranged to meet him at the edge of the street where her house was located. At first, the police declined to comment on the situation, but new details soon emerged. It turned out that Brian had gone to the same school as Nicole and knew her personally. The guy claimed he had only spoken to the young woman a few times in his life and had never corresponded with her on Facebook. Against this backdrop, another oddity was noticed. There were two Brian Butterfield Facebook accounts. Only one of them was deleted the night Nicole disappeared. Brian himself stated that he only had one account and had nothing to do with the second account. Furthermore, he was aware of the existence of this fake page and had even complained to the police a few weeks before Nicole disappeared. It all looked really strange, and the police were in no hurry to accuse the young man of any crime. Instead, they continued to search the area around Glenbin, hoping to find some evidence. At the same time, the computer department was taking a detailed look at this suspicious Facebook account. On Friday, May 17th, the sheriff turned to the public for information. Police were looking for a black Ford Ranger pickup truck and asked for any information about the vehicle. They clarified that the driver's involvement in the young woman's disappearance has not been determined and it is too early to draw any conclusions. The sheriff also announced a 24-hour hotline for any tips on the case. They had to allocate a separate number as the number of calls had crossed several hundred. They were enlisting volunteers to search the area. They set up assembly points and put people into groups. The volunteers were to look for anything that might be relevant. And this time, the search area was greatly expanded. It extended to the two nearest towns, Bangor and Old Town. More than 500 people responded to the police call. The crowd included about 400 local residents and about 100 professional volunteers from the various counties. Were off-road vehicle and horse-drawn search parties. Given the sheer scale of the operation and the rough terrain, the authorities tried to use every resource possible. They even used aerial photography in the hope that the footage might reveal something of value to the investigation. The day after the search, exactly one week after Nicole's disappearance, the police issued a disappointing statement. The young woman's body was found near Old Town, not far from Road 43. They were in no hurry to release any details, specifying only that the body was covered with branches and was discovered by a service dog. Soon it was announced that the police had a homicide case, and the next day, May 20th, they reported the arrest of a suspect. It turned out to be a 20-year-old local man named Kyle Duby. No details were known at the time, and the public was kept in the dark for some time. The next day he was formally charged with premeditated murder. At the same time, it turned out that at the time of his arrest, he was already in prison. The guy had been sentenced to 90 days in jail for eluding police and a motorcycle accident last year. Kyle began serving a sentence three days before Nicole's body was discovered, but had been on the outside until then. According to the young woman's friends, she had known Kyle for several months. The day before she disappeared, she complained to several friends that Kyle had tried to kiss her, and Nicole had to give him a serious fight to get him to stop. Nevertheless, the police so far had kept the evidence against the man a secret. It was known that he lived with his parents and a four-year-old daughter, over whom he had custody. Kyle was also dating an 18-year-old young woman named Sarah and worked for a local disability care company. His attorney asked for a closed-door preliminary hearing and the judge granted the request. Consequently, the public and the media had no access to information about the case and the judge's decision was criticized. Nicole's funeral was held on May 26. Beforehand, several hundred local residents gathered and honored her memory by launching balloons into the sky. A few days after the funeral, a judge, under public pressure, lifted a public disclosure ban on the case and some disturbing facts finally came to light. First, police were able to determine that the fake Facebook account was registered from Kyle's computer and all subsequent sessions were conducted from his IP address. This meant that it was Kyle who had tricked her out of the house shortly before the murder and it was clear from the medical examiner's report that the young woman had died on the very day of her disappearance. Second, the police had several important witnesses at once, Kyle's own brother and his girlfriend. According to Sarah, whom the suspect was dating, Kyle confessed to her about the murder a few days after it happened. 
This happened immediately after Sarah was called in for questioning. There it became clear to her that the suspect was not the suspect. That the police had suspicions about Kyle, but there was no evidence. He was also questioned but stated that he was at work the day the young woman disappeared. Kyle told his brother that he lured Nicole to the outskirts of town using a fake Facebook account. The guy planned to make it look like Brian Butterfield had kidnapped her and was holding her in a remote location. Next, Kyle planned to find her and set her free. Which he thought would make the young woman fall in love with her savior. It all sounds strange to say the least, but there is more to come. Remember only that this is the perpetrator's own version, told to his brother. Further events unfolded as follows. From a fake account, Kyle lured Nicole to a remote location along Hudson Road. There he was already waiting for her, lurking in the bushes. He was wearing a ski hat, covering his face. When Nicole arrived at the appointed spot, he pounced on her, wrapped tape around her head, and loaded her into his father's pickup truck, a black Ford Ranger. The car was parked nearby. Next, in his own words, Kyle drove her away from the abduction site. As he began to pull her out of the car, he noticed that the young woman showed no signs of life. The guy realized that the duct tape made it impossible for her to breathe, and she passed away. Then, he panicked and decided to hide the body. To his girlfriend, Kyle told the same story, adding some details. He said that before he hid the body, he took off almost all of Nicole's clothes and threw her out the car window on the way back home. This was done so that the police would not find traces of his DNA. The police did find several items of clothing that belonged to the young woman. They were in virtually the same place where Kyle had attacked Nicole. The key point here was that Kyle told his girlfriend almost exactly where he had hid in the body. It was because Sarah went to the police telling the whole story that they were able to locate Nicole's body. Kyle himself refused to admit guilt, but the situation was far from in his favor. When the police uncovered all the details of the medical examination, more serious evidence emerged against the suspect. Under Nicole's fingernails, blood was found that matched Kyle's DNA sample exactly. When the boy was questioned a few days after the murder, there were deep scratches on his face. He himself attributed it to an injury he sustained at work. Also, the cause of the young woman's death was strangulation, as evidenced by the injuries to the neck. And this went against Kyle's versions of what he told his brother and the young woman. If he had taped the victim's mouth and nose, there would have been no such injuries. His lawyer requested a psychological evaluation, which caused the trial to slow down. But a few months after his arrest, something interesting happened. Kyle was charged with theft after a stolen gun was found in his home. The guy had been arrested multiple times before for robbery. But each time he got away with a fine. An examination showed Kyle to be completely sane and a trial was set for February 2015. While awaiting trial, the defendant was in jail. Before the trial began, Kyle's attorney filed a motion to exclude certain witness statements from the case file. One of them was the correctional officer where Kyle arrived to serve a sentence for eluding police and a motorcycle accident. According to the officer, the guy was acting very nervous and even crying. When asked why he was so nervous, Kyle said something like, it's not about the time limit, it's about what else I've done. The trial began on February 22, 2015. Kyle's lawyer stated that his client was innocent of murder and that the investigation was completely biased. According to the defense, he was at home at the time of the murder and Nicole was attacked by someone else. Kyle's girlfriend, Sarah, was named as a possible suspect. She allegedly hated Nicole because of her association with her boyfriend. The lawyer claimed that she had access to Kyle's computer, from which she could create a fake account to frame her boyfriend after the murder. This theory had no corroboration and went against the actual evidence. Kyle logged into the fake account not only from his computer, but also from his phone. What's more, he logged in through one app changing his personal account to a fake one. Because of this, it was clearly visible when he logged out to one account and immediately logged into another. Also, there was no physical evidence against Sarah, unlike Kyle. His DNA was found not only under the victim's fingernails, but also on her clothes, which the killer threw away on his way home. The next witness was the real Brian because Brian had previously dated his girlfriend. 
In his opinion, this is what led Kyle to create a fake account with his name so that he could frame the young man if anything happened. The prosecution also provided screenshots of correspondence showing that Kyle was not only communicating with Nicole, but also with other underage young women. The next witness was a colleague of Kyle's who worked with him at a disability care company. The defendant's lawyer insisted that the scratches on Kyle's face appeared while he was working, but the witness denied this. According to his story, on May 11th and 12th, he and Kyle were at the home of a woman suffering from mental illness. At one time, she became aggressive and attacked Kyle, leaving several scratches on his face near his eye. Kyle went to the hospital for help, only to notice the next day, May 13th, a co-worker noticed new scars on his face. This happened right after Nicole disappeared. Another co-worker said that the day Nicole disappeared, Kyle left work at about 9 p.m. and did not return until 6 a.m., even though he was supposed to be on duty all night. At the same time, he asked that he not tell anyone about his absence. The court also summoned four inmates with whom Kyle had interacted while in jail, awaiting trial. They all said that Kyle had confessed to them about killing the young woman. To one of them, he told them he had strangled his girlfriend and made it look like an accident. To the other, he openly stated that he had originally planned to commit the crime. Even more interesting was the testimony of an inmate named Scott Ford. He had spent most of his life behind bars and had a reputation for being well-versed in the legal system. Kyle had been in contact with him for a long time. After which he decided to inquire about the best way for him to get away with his crime. Next, Kyle wrote several versions on paper of what had happened to Nicole and handed the pieces of paper with this information to Ford. All of these versions had one thing in common. Kyle admitted that he had created a fake account and lured Nicole to a deserted area, but he went on to describe different versions of events. First, he wrote that he had just wanted to kidnap her and then rescue her, but he didn't settle for duct tape and the young woman suffocated. On another sheet he said that he had jumped Nicole out of the bushes and she fainted from fright. Panic, Kyle duct taped her mouth shut and drove her away from town, after which he noticed she had no pulse. Another version was that he didn't use the duct tape and the young woman died for nothing. Another version said that Kyle jumped out of the bushes and grabbed her torso. Then realized that he had actually squeezed her throat, after which she lost consciousness. As we can see, all of these stories seem downright delusional, but there was something really useful in them for the investigation. Kyle described in detail the place where he attacked her, and where and how he hid the body. Moreover, he specified the exact location where he had hidden the ski mask in which he had attacked the young woman. All this information was kept secret until the beginning of the trial. So only the killer could know such details. Experts examined the sheets and found fingerprints and Kyle's DNA on them. The trial was not without his difficulties. Kyle's younger brother, who had testified against him two years earlier, began to deny the fact that Kyle had confessed to the murder. The problem was that the brother had written down all the details of what had happened in great detail. Which he could only have learned from Kyle. The only one who didn't utter a word during the entire trial was Kyle himself. He refused to testify even in his own defense. The investigation offered him a deal in which he could expect a reduced sentence in exchange for a confession, but he refused. On March 6, 2016, the final court hearing was held at which the verdict was handed down. Kyle was found guilty of the premeditated murder of Nicole. His relatives and attorney tried to get a lenient sentence, citing his age and having a young daughter, but the court refused to make concessions. Kyle received 60 years for murder and another 30 for kidnapping. In closing arguments, the judge noted that the evidence against Kyle was overwhelming and his guilt in the case was clear. Instead of showing remorse and confessing, he made up various versions of what happened and tried his best to avoid prison. For this reason, the court refused to commute his sentence. Moreover, the judge was inclined to believe that Kyle had originally planned to kill Nicole, a plan he had been working on for weeks. Nicole's parents called the sentence fair and expressed the hope that he would never get out of prison again. They also gave numerous interviews and appeared on various television shows talking about the dangers of social media, using their daughter's murder as an example. In their opinion, the tragedy could have been avoided if the perpetrator had not had the opportunity to impersonate another person online. 
However, people like Kyle, sooner or later, can get to the point of murder even without fake accounts. Share your opinion on this story. This creepy story happened in the middle of 2021. A young woman went on a first date with a guy to the movies, but that evening turned into a tragedy. Despite the fact that this case was fairly quickly solved, there are so many strange and shocking moments in it. In this video, we will tell you what happened to Riley Goodrich and Anthony Baraha. Riley Goodrich was born and raised in the American city of Corona, California. In school she played volleyball and was a cheerleader, as well as had many friends. They described her as a positive, open and fun-loving young woman with a big heart. After graduating from high school, Riley received a scholarship to Grand Canyon University in Arizona. She moved to a dormitory but tried to visit her family whenever possible. In the summer of 2021, she finished her first year and returned to Corona for the holidays. On July 4th, on Independence Day, her friends threw a big party. There, Riley met a young man named Anthony Baraha, who was a year older than her. They quickly developed a liking for each other and continued to communicate in the following days. Anthony, unexpectedly, became a popular figure on TikTok. In 2019, he created an account where he posted various humorous videos. At some point his videos began to attract the attention of a wide audience and by the summer of 2021 he had almost 1 million subscribers. The guy also actively developed his account on Instagram but was still trying to figure out what to do in the future, continue to run his blog as his main activity or do something else. After chatting for some time on social media, they decided to go on a first date but it was important for Riley that her father Dave approved of her choice. Despite the fact that she was already 18 years old at that time, the young woman was very close to her parents and wanted them to meet Anthony first. At first the young woman's father was skeptical, mostly because Anthony made a living through TikTok. It all seemed not very serious to him. However, when they met in person, Anthony made a good impression on Dave and the father approved of his daughter's choice. The guy seemed to him kind, well-mannered and overall a positive person. In the end, Riley and Anthony decided to meet on July 26th and go to an evening movie session, choosing the movie The Forever Purge. The plot of the film is based on the fact that in the United States, every year they including murder. Who would have thought how creepy of a coincidence it would be to choose this movie? Before heading to the cinema, they had dinner at their favorite restaurant, Riley located nearby. Their screening started at 9.30 p.m. and ended closer to midnight. Considering it was a weekday, there were not many people in the theater. During the movie Riley messaged her mother that the film seemed boring to her, but she still enjoyed the day with Anthony. The young woman did not contact her mother anymore after that. When the movie ended, a theater employee went into the hall to clean up the room. To his surprise, he found Riley and Anthony there. From a distance it seemed to him that the couple was just sitting or sleeping in their seats, but as soon as he took a few steps towards them, he was horrified to discover that both visitors were seriously wounded and unconscious. The police and ambulance arrived at the scene. The medics almost immediately determined that Riley had already passed away. Anthony was still alive but in a serious, unconscious condition. He was taken to the local hospital and connected to life support equipment while detectives began investigating the crime scene. At first it was difficult for them to understand what had happened in the theater. The only thing they managed to establish almost immediately was that the police had already was the fact that Riley and Anthony were shot in the head. However, there were no clues at the crime scene that could shed light on what had happened. Of course, it was absolutely useless for detectives to take fingerprints or search for DNA samples in the cinema, so they went a different way. Almost immediately the story spread through California media and later throughout the country. In the first hours of the investigation, there was even a theory that Anthony could have been the killer, allegedly shooting Riley and then taking his own life, but the police did not even consider this version, if only because in that case the weapon would have been lying nearby and it was nowhere to be found. As soon as the detectives identified the victims' identities, they contacted their families and informed them of what had happened. Riley's parents simply could not believe that their daughter was dead. Just a few minutes before her death, she was texting with her mother, and no one could have thought that something so tragic could happen during a movie screening. 
In addition, the police could not provide any details to her relatives about what had happened, as they themselves still had no idea what had happened in that theater. As for Anthony, the doctor's prognosis was bleak. The young man had suffered a serious injury, and the medical staff had to do everything possible to help him. First, the detectives questioned the theater employees who worked that evening. It turned out that only six tickets were sold for the showing. This meant that the killer was most likely one of the four visitors. There was another aspect that puzzled not only the police, but also everyone who learned about this incident from the news. If the killer was one of the six viewers, how did the other two visitors not hear the sounds of gunfire? The only explanation at that time was that the killer was one of the six visitors. Was the version that the other two viewers simply took the sounds of gunfire as part of the movie. This action movie had many violent scenes, including the use of weapons. The theory that the killer struck during one of these scenes was not excluded. However, this mystery was quickly solved. Detectives found that out of all the tickets sold, four were purchased by one person for himself and three of his friends. Could have been committed by a group of people. The investigation continued all night and the next day the police announced the arrest of the suspect. He turned out to be 20-year-old Joseph Jimenez. The interesting fact here is that pure chance helped to catch the suspect. It turned out that Joseph himself called the police the next day after the murder, but he did not do this to confess to the crime. At around 9.30 p.m., Joseph called 911 and reported that someone was chasing him. When the police arrived they found him in the middle of the street with a gun in his hand and arrested him. They immediately realized that the attack in the theater was carried out using a weapon of the same caliber, so they handed Joseph's gun over to the experts. Having three empty shells from the theater in their hands, they established that this was the same weapon. But the detectives quickly found another weighty evidence. Searching the suspect's house, they found Riley Goodrich's wallet there. Later, the police located the other three individuals who were at the movie theater. Theater with Joseph. It turned out that they were all friends with him, but their story truly shocked the detectives. According to them, none of them had any idea that a simple trip to the movies would turn into such a tragedy. They were just sitting and watching the film, but during the screening they began to notice something strange. Joseph suddenly began to behave very suspiciously. He was talking to himself and muttering something at some point he said that he needed to go to the bathroom and left. However, instead of going to the bathroom, he went to his car, took out a gun and returned. After sitting for some time, he suddenly told his friends that he had brought a gun from his car and they began to panic. In the end the friends allegedly lied to him, saying that they also needed to use the bathroom and would return. But instead they left and went outside. There were many strange moments in their story that could be doubted. The most concerning part was their escape from the theater. Did they really not try to find out why Joseph brought a gun and did they not consider that he might use it against the two other moviegoers? Moreover the friends did not report any of this to theater staff or the police. Joseph's behavior, practically indisputable, indicated that he was planning to do something bad. But his friends decided to simply ignore the entire situation, and they admitted that as soon as they heard about the murder, they immediately thought of Joseph. All of this was enough to arrest Jimenez on three charges, murder, attempted murder, and robbery. At that time Anthony was still on life support, but in the end, the doctors could not help him. On the evening of July 31st, he passed away without regaining consciousness. In connection with this, Joseph was charged with an additional count of murder, which carried the possibility of a death sentence. While detectives tried to get any information from him, hundreds of concerned people held a farewell ceremony in memory of Riley and Anthony outside the movie theater. They lit candles and expressed words of support to the families of the victims. It was then that it became known that long before the incident, Anthony had signed papers allowing his organs to be donated to those in need in the event of his death. The young man could hardly have imagined that it would happen so soon. The situation was not looking good for Joseph Jimenez. With the evidence against him, he was almost guaranteed to end up on death row. Apparently, he understood this perfectly and decided to confess to the crime. However, his story raised even more questions. Joseph claimed that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia nine months ago, which he had been managing with medication. 
Shortly before the incident, he stopped taking his medication and voices started to appear in his head. At first they told him that someone was going to steal his car and TV, but later they threatened to kill his entire family. On the night at the cinema, he heard the voices again and this time, they ordered him to kill Riley and Anthony. They also promised to kill his entire family if he refused. According to Jimenez, he tried to resist these voices, but in the end he gave in and committed the crime. In his speech he devoted a lot of attention to how scared he was during the murder and in the following hours, as well as how he worried about his future. Of course, this turn in the case was perceived ambiguously. Let's look at the facts and try to understand if we can trust him. Could Joseph have made up this whole story about the voices? Of course. Moreover, only serious mental problems could have saved him from the death penalty in this case, so it was his only chance to avoid such a sentence. In addition, the petty theft of Riley's wallet does not fit into his story, according to which Joseph was so frightened that he immediately ran out of the cinema and got into his car after the shots. Who, in a panic, is going to steal a wallet? On the other hand, there are still many strange moments in his actions. If we believe his friends, he'd talk to himself and behave suspiciously. In addition, Joseph himself called the police, saying that someone was chasing him, but in reality, he was just standing in the middle of the street with a gun. If we assume that all of this was a planned game, the plan to avoid responsibility seems too complicated. But if we still consider such an option, the situation could have developed in a completely different way. During the movie Joseph realized that there were only two random people in the theater who he could rob. He went to his car to get a weapon, but something went wrong or perhaps he truly intended to commit murder. It's possible his friends were even present at the time and didn't leave the theater. However, it's unclear why he didn't take the victim's smartphones if that was his motive and why did he call the police the next day instead of hoping not to be caught. Additionally, Joseph had no criminal history and had never been in trouble even for minor offenses. It's hard to imagine someone without a criminal past suddenly committing double murder over a wallet, especially with such a high likelihood of being caught. In late September, the first court hearing took place, during which Joseph pleaded not guilty, citing his mental state. This doesn't mean he denies involvement in the murders, but now the court needed to consider the issue of his sanity. Jimenez stated that he would only plead guilty if deemed insane. The next court hearing was scheduled for the first half of 2022. A decision about the defendant's mental state has not yet been made, as he still needs to undergo evaluation. In any case, whatever the outcome of this case, it is shocking in its injustice. The two innocent young men simply wanted to spend an evening at the movies and ended up as victims of a completely random act of aggression. The public and media blamed the theater management for not checking Joseph upon entering the theater. But should they be blamed? In the United States, theater staff only check backpacks and bags. Prevent visitors from bringing in outside food. But if someone brings a gun and hides it under their clothes, no one will ever know. The only thing that can be done in such a situation is to install metal detectors in every theater. Perhaps this will become a mandatory requirement over time. What do you think? Was Joseph truly mentally ill and that led to his horrific act? Or was the story about the voices fabricated to avoid a death sentence? Share your thoughts in the comments and thank you for watching. An 18-year-old student came home for the holidays, but after a few days she disappeared without a trace. Her mother began receiving strange messages and soon the police got involved. What they discovered during the investigation truly shocked the entire family and none of them were prepared for such a truth. Soon she had two younger sisters, but in 2005 her parents divorced and the young women stayed with their mother. In 2010 her mother remarried and they had another daughter. Thus Angelica had three younger sisters with whom she got along well. Angelica graduated from a local high school and enrolled at Longwood University in Farmville located about three hours from home. She joined two sports teams and planned to finish her studies a year early, which required her to work at an accelerated pace. Despite this, she regularly visited her family in Norfolk to see her parents and sisters. In March 2015, when Angelica was 18, she went home for spring break, planning to stay there for a few days. 
Angelica had a great time with her family, was in a great mood and was happy to have the opportunity. Live at home again. On the morning of March 2nd, her mother prepared her three younger daughters for school and then went to work, leaving Angelica alone at home. However, when her mother returned from work in the afternoon, Angelica was no longer there. Everything looked like she had left in a hurry. The back door was open, music was playing, and only some of her things were loaded into the washing machine. Her mother found this strange because she and her daughter constantly kept in touch and Angelica was supposed to inform her if she was going somewhere. But that day Angelica didn't answer her phone. Then her mother wrote to her and asked where she had gone. Angelica replied that she had gone for a walk with friends but didn't specify where exactly and when she planned to return home. They exchanged several messages and her mother noticed something strange again. According to her, the messages from her daughter were very different in style from what she was used to. Usually, Angelica wrote her detailed messages, telling her all the details. But this time, she only received short and vague phrases. Despite this, her mother did not suspect anything bad, especially since her daughter was already 18 years old. And she thought that the young woman just wanted to spend time with her friends. On that day, Angelica never came home, but continued to respond to messages. However, she still did not give clear answers about where she was and when she planned to return home. In the second half of the day, the young woman stopped responding to her mother. Then she decided to call Angelica's friends and found out that none of them had seen her daughter. And did not know where she was. By the evening of March 3rd, the mother decided to turn to the police. Detectives began an investigation and at first glance it seemed like the young woman had left on her own free will. Soon this version was supported by a note found in the house. Angelica's mother claimed that it was probably written in her daughter's handwriting. There was only one sentence with a very strange content. Angelica wrote that due to everything that was happening, she needed time alone with herself. No one in her family could understand what she meant. The young woman was cheerful, spent all of her free time studying and making plans for the future. She never mentioned any serious problems in her life, so the note seemed meaningless. The police also found that Angelica left her clothes, wallet and car at home. This already contradicted the version that she had gone somewhere of her own free will. However, at that time, there was no evidence to the contrary. The first lead appeared several days after the investigation. A neighbor named Cody, who lived near Angelica's family, found a piece of her credit card near his house. He reported this to the police and immediately became the main suspect. Detectives assumed that he could have some connection to her disappearance, so they questioned him for 12 hours. He denied his guilt and yet the police did not rush to remove suspicion from him. Angelica's relatives also believed that he was hiding something. By that time, all residents of the area knew about this case and many tried to help the investigation. People formed teams and searched the area for any evidence. They all began to suspect Cody after the credit card incident. Moreover, it turned out that he and Angelica attended the same school and dated for some time. Soon, another event occurred that indicated his involvement in her disappearance. Less than a week after the investigation began, Angelica's stepfather, Wesley Hadsell, burst into Cody's house and found Angelica's jacket there. The situation developed quite strangely. Wesley, who was involved in the search for his daughter with her friends, told them to go to Cody's house and look for Angelica's things, as he believed that the boy was involved in her disappearance. The friends did just that. They went to Cody's house and found her jacket there, which they immediately reported to the police. Cody was interrogated again, putting serious pressure on him. Despite this, Cody said that he had no idea where the jacket came from. All of this greatly confused investigators. On the one hand, the jacket in Cody's house was a very serious piece of evidence. But on the other hand, during the interrogation, the detectives had a strong impression that the boy was telling them the truth. He was willing to voluntarily provide his DNA sample, undergo a polygraph test, and do whatever they asked. But most importantly, he provided an alibi for the day of Angelica's disappearance. The police checked this information and concluded that he could really be innocent. Then they talked to Angelica's friends who found the jacket and they told them that Wesley, Angelica's stepfather, gave them the tip. With this information, the detectives allowed that the man here was the main question, why would he do that? 
The most obvious option was that Wesley was involved in his daughter's disappearance. The police began to study his biography and found that the man had more than 10 convictions for crimes of varying degrees of severity, and even more charges were not proven in court. He was repeatedly arrested for robbery, possession, and use of illegal substances. He kidnapped his own wife and subjected her to violence for several days. However, the court could not prove his guilt, so he did not receive any serious punishment. He had been in prison several times in his life, spending several years there in total. The detectives also found out that a few weeks before Angelica's disappearance, her mother kicked Wesley out of the house because he started using heavy illegal substances. Since then, he had been living in a hotel. All of this was enough to seriously consider him a suspect. During the interrogation, the man claimed that he had nothing to do with the disappearance of his daughter and was actively trying to find her. When asked when he last saw Angelica, Wesley stated that he saw her at a gas station around noon on the day of her disappearance. The young woman had asked him for a few hundred dollars before they parted ways. However, the detectives reviewed the footage from the gas station cameras and found no evidence to support his claim. Wesley's colleagues at work reported that he had taken a few hours off on that day as his daughter had asked him for money. He returned to work at around 2 p.m. and was extremely nervous. There was an obvious contradiction in his statement. Wesley had told his colleagues that he needed to leave because his daughter had asked for money, but he told the police that he had accidentally spotted Angelica at the gas station while driving by. Furthermore, Angelica's car was parked near her home, so it was unclear why she would be at the gas station. When asked why he left work that day, Wesley stated that the alarm at the house where he lived before the quarrel with his wife had gone off and he received a notification on his phone. The police could not verify this information and did not explain the obvious contradictions in his statement. The police then obtained a warrant to search Wesley's motel room, where he had been staying for the past few weeks. They found something interesting. Wesley had been keeping firearms and a large number of bullets. Since Wesley had several convictions, the law prohibited him from owning weapons, so he was immediately arrested. However, there was no evidence related to Angelica in his room. Thus, Wesley was charged with three crimes, illegal possession of a weapon, breaking into Cody's house, and tampering with evidence due to the jacket he had supposedly planted. He still insisted that he had nothing to do with his daughter's disappearance and was doing everything he could to find her. As a result, the court sentenced him to 20 years in prison and the detectives continued to search for the young woman. They confiscated Wesley's work vehicle and found a shovel, tape, and dark gloves inside. However, the most interesting item was the GPS navigator, which they sent experts for analysis. The investigators wanted to know where Wesley had gone in the days after Angelica's disappearance. According to the data they received, on March 4th, Wesley had driven to a neighboring town, 90 kilometers away from Norfolk. His car had stayed in one place for 20 minutes before he drove back to work. Having arrived at the location on April 9th, the detective saw that his car was parked near an abandoned house in a remote area. After searching the area, they eventually found Angelica's body in a ditch not far from the building. She was covered with a piece of plywood, but even without it, it would have been extremely difficult to find her by chance, as the area around the house was overgrown and inaccessible. So no one could have stumbled upon her. The body was sent for a medical examination and an unexpected statement awaited all participants in the process. According to the results, a dose of prohibited substances was found in the young woman's blood, which was three times the lethal dose for an average person. Angelica's family was in shock. The young woman didn't even drink alcohol, was actively involved in sports, and devoted almost all her time to studying. No one could believe that she was taking prohibited substances. Medical experts decided to conduct additional tests by analyzing the hair. It is possible to determine whether a person has taken narcotic drugs in the past, and this analysis showed that Angelica had never dealt with prohibited substances before. This made the version that she suddenly took a triple dose of her own free will practically impossible. In addition, someone buried her body in the ditch and covered it with a piece of plywood. Everything indicated that the young woman could have been given these substances against her will with the sole purpose of killing her and making it look like an accident. 
The detectives questioned Wesley again, who was already in prison at the time. The first question they asked him was what his work car was doing. Near the house where Angelica's body was found. The man's version was, to put it mildly, unconvincing. He said that he could have been set up and that he didn't go there himself. At the same time, he had previously said that no one except him had access to this car. Wesley even suggested that someone could have taken the navigator from his car, driven to that house, and returned the gadget back. Meanwhile, the police collected footage from various street cameras located along the way to this house, and they did indeed manage to find several recordings that showed that on that same day, Wesley was in the city where his daughter's body was found, driving his work car. Despite all this pointing to the man's involvement in the murder, the court needed more evidence. Therefore, the police continued to work on this case for several more years. Trying to find irrefutable evidence. As a result, Wesley was charged with the murder of Angelica only at the end of 2018. The main court hearings began in January, 2022, according to the prosecution's version of events. On March 2nd, Wesley arrived at the house where Angelica was located with the sole purpose of kidnapping her for the purpose of committing violent acts. He took her out of the house, carried out his plan and gave her a triple dose of prohibited substances because he initially planned to make it look like an accident. During countless interrogations, the police repeatedly found that the man carefully thought out his versions and tried in every way to divert suspicion from himself. The prosecution managed to find a witness who supported their version, a person who sold Wesley. The same prohibited drugs that Angelica died from. The court also heard that the police found Angelica's phone on the street and its location data was compared with Leslie's phone data. Since the young woman's disappearance, her smartphone was next to Wesley's smartphone, even when messages were sent from her mother's account. This indicated that it was Wesley who took Angelica's phone and tried to convince her mother that everything was okay with the young woman. The defendant's lawyers insisted that their client was innocent. According to their version, the young woman was depressed and decided to end her own life, and Wesley had nothing to do with it. This version did not explain why his car was near the place where her body was found or who buried her, covering her with a piece of plywood. All these arguments tried to explain either coincidences or attempts to frame Wesley. Interestingly, the man had said many times before that he did not believe in the overdose version and believed that Angelica was murdered. But for some reason, his opinion changed in court. It took the jury less than an hour to reach a verdict. Wesley was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. The man said he would appeal the verdict and theoretically, he has a high enough chance of getting it overturned. As you may have already guessed, there is not a single material evidence against him. For example, no samples of his DNA were found on the victim's body, which would have been practically unquestionable evidence of guilt. The prosecution's main argument is the fact that Wesley's work car was actually located near the place where the young woman's body was later found. All other arguments are not serious evidence. Although just this person's past alone makes any of his words questionable. Considering that 10 years before the incident, he also kidnapped his wife and subjected her to violence, the prosecution's version seems more than convincing. But due to the lack of more significant evidence, lawyers may well challenge this verdict and achieve a new hearing. What do you think? Is Wesley guilty of murder, or does he have nothing to do with what happened? Share your opinion in the comments. A woman was found dead in her own apartment and from the very beginning of the investigation the case was very strange. The only serious clue was a bite left by the attacker on the victim's body. It took the police over 20 years to finally uncover the horrifying truth, but such a turn of events caused a lot of dissatisfaction and criticism as no one expected such an outcome. Sherry Rasmussen was born on February 7, 1957 in the state of Washington. She grew up in a large and friendly family with two sisters and loving parents. Later they moved to the city of Tucson, Arizona, where Sherry attended the local school. She was an excellent student and even finished elementary school a year ahead of her peers. Sherry completed the entire seventh grade program on summer vacation by herself. After graduating from high school in 1973, she enrolled in a California college where her older sister was already studying. 
In her first year, Sherry decided to pursue a medical education and become a nurse, for which she had to take additional courses at another institution. After graduating from college in 1975, Sherry decided to get a master's degree at the University of California, Los Angeles, and also worked there as a nurse to pay for her education. After receiving her master's degree at the age of 23, her father bought her an apartment in the suburbs of Los Angeles. But Sherry did not want to live off her parents, so she wrote her father a check every month for the entire amount of the mortgage payments. She also got a job at a local hospital, heading the nursing department for caring for seriously ill people. In May 1984, when Sherry was 27 years old, she met a man named John Rutten. They immediately hit it off and the couple started dating. John had a good education, worked as a computer engineer, and was a very intelligent young man. A year later the couple decided to get married and, after that, John moved into Sherry's apartment. The newlyweds spent their honeymoon in Jamaica, after which they returned home to celebrate with Sherry's family. It seemed that this couple was destined for a happy and carefree future. On February 24th of the following year, when John was getting ready for work as usual, Sherry complained of feeling unwell and decided to stay home. She asked John to call her in a few hours. At around 7.20 am John left for work. Closer to 10 am John tried to reach her by phone but she didn't answer. Half an hour later he tried again but still no answer. So he called her workplace to check if she had gone to work but Sherry hadn't shown up at the hospital either. Her sister also tried to reach her but without success. John returned home from work at around 6 p.m. and immediately noticed something strange. The garage door was open, even though he had closed it in the morning and Sherry's car was missing. Therefore, he first thought that she had gone somewhere. As he approached the garage, he saw a lot of broken glass and immediately discovered its source. There was a small balcony above the garage with a glass door which had been smashed. He entered the house through the garage and to his horror, found Sherry there. She was lying on the floor, her body badly disfigured. John immediately called the police and detectives began to examine the crime scene. In all the rooms, there was complete chaos, broken vases, overturned furniture, scattered items. A bloody handprint was found on the wall next to the alarm button. Apparently the victim tried to reach it, but failed. In addition to extensive bruises and wounds, experts noticed a human bite mark on Sherry's wrist. Apart from all of the above, the marks on her hands indicated that the attacker tied up the victim before untying her. The cause of death was three close-range gunshot wounds. Detectives found a blanket with bullet holes in the apartment and concluded that the attacker wrapped the gun in it to muffle the sound of the shots. Detectives immediately concluded that there was a prolonged struggle between the attacker and Sherry. This was evidenced by the amount of scattered and broken items throughout the apartment as well as a bloody mark next to the alarm button. The lead investigator quickly concluded that they were dealing with a failed robbery. According to his opinion, at least two criminals broke into Sherry's apartment but they didn't expect her to be home. A struggle ensued between them and Sherry fought for her life until the end. Several facts supported the robbery version. Firstly, Sherry's car disappeared from the garage. Secondly, someone had placed the stereo equipment and player next to the staircase leading to the second floor. According to the police, the robbers wanted to take them and leave, but after the scuffle and murder, they fled the scene. However, there were some dubious moments in this version. Firstly, the police did not find any signs of forced entry. This meant that either Sherry let the criminals in herself or they had a key. Secondly, the perpetrators did not touch absolutely all the valuable items including the jewelry box standing in plain sight. Detectives interviewed all of Sherry's neighbors, but it didn't yield any new leads. Some residents heard the sounds of a struggle, but not gunshots. They also didn't see anyone entering the woman's apartment. Experts took blood samples and fingerprints from the house, but they couldn't conduct DNA analysis in 1985. The lead investigator also took a piece of cotton and soaked it in the trace of the bite on Sherry's body. He hoped that the attacker's saliva could be left behind and eventually experts could use this clue to catch the killer. After a thorough search of the apartment, detectives learned one interesting fact. It turned out that the criminals took only one thing, Sherry and John's marriage certificate. 
This was very strange and also raised suspicions about the man himself. But his alibi was unquestionable. John was at work until the evening and he simply couldn't have committed this crime. Moreover, he himself told the police about the disappearance of this document. Detectives were unable to find an explanation for this strange fact. After a week and a half, they found Sherry's car in a parking lot, four kilometers from her apartment. It was unlocked and the keys were in the ignition. Forensic experts tried to find fingerprints, but they were unsuccessful. Either the criminals only touched it with gloves on, or they wiped away all the fingerprints. Two months after the murder that took place just a few hundred meters from Sherry's home, a robbery occurred. Detectives immediately found many similarities. Two criminals broke into a stranger's apartment through the garage, threatened the owner with a gun, and stole stereo equipment. The lead investigator immediately thought that these two were behind the woman's murder, so the police tried to find them. From witness accounts they created approximate composite sketches of the suspects and also learned that both men were Latino, but they were never found. However, investigators did not show much interest in getting to the truth, which constantly irritated Sherry's parents. Her father regularly went to the police station, inquired about the progress of the investigation, and asked the detectives to consider different versions. Once he even asked them to take a closer look at John's ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Lazarus, who was a police officer herself. Sherry had told her father several times that she was obsessed with John, but the investigators only laughed at this version. They told him to watch fewer detective shows. The thing was that Stephanie couldn't accept John's departure. Learning that he was going to marry another woman, she came to Sherry's workplace. Stephanie told her that their marriage was doomed and that she and John would be together again sooner or later. In addition, she said that John had slept with her already after becoming engaged to Sherry. Of course, after this visit, Sherry was deeply upset. Upon returning home, she told John what had happened and he admitted that he had indeed slept with Stephanie. After she found out about his engagement, the young woman begged him to come over, spoke of her love, and urged him to return to her. But he said he loved Sherry and intended to marry her. Then Stephanie offered to sleep with him one last time and John agreed. He apologized to Sherry and said it was a huge mistake on his part. The woman forgave him and this incident with Stephanie gradually faded away. But the story didn't end there. Stephanie came to their home several times without warning under various pretexts. Once she came with a set of skis and announced that John promised to wax them for her. The next time she entered their apartment when the man was not at home. Sherry did not even hear how she entered the room and was shocked to see Stephanie in her living room. When asked what she was doing there the woman said she came to talk to John. Sherry had a hard time convincing her to leave. Later, she even thought of going to the police about this incident, but did not. The woman was afraid that if she told about the harassment by their own employee, they would just laugh at her. She also wondered how Stephanie managed to enter the residential complex. It was surrounded by a high fence and a special pass was required to enter. Apparently, the woman used her police badge and the security let her in. As for Stephanie's apartment, there had to be a duplicate key. Otherwise she simply could not have entered without breaking the lock. In addition to this, Sherry repeatedly noticed that someone was following her. Once she and John were sitting in a restaurant and the woman saw someone staring at them intently. As soon as she looked at this person, he immediately left. Sherry did not see his face because it was covered with a hood. It could be Stephanie. The victim's father told detectives about all these incidents, but they did not attach any importance to his words. They were sure that the murder was committed by the two Mexicans who robbed an apartment near Sherry's home. Three months after the murder, something interesting happened. Some documents from Sherry's case disappeared from the police station. Among them were records of detectives about the progress of the investigation. They had to record almost every step related to the investigation of this crime. But at one point, the police simply could not find these journals. However, there were no important leads there anyway. Since then, the case has been hanging for years. Detectives did not show much desire to look for new leads despite constant pressure from Sherry's parents. Eight months after the murder, Sherry's father offered a reward of $10,000. For any information that would help find the perpetrator. 
A year later, he held a press conference where he again promised a reward for information, but in both cases, it yielded no results. Seven years later, the lead investigator on the case retired. The victim's father decided to meet with his successor, hoping that he would take his job more seriously. Additionally, it was 1993 and DNA analysis technology was already being actively used by the police to solve crimes. Sherry's father asked the detective to perform such an analysis and even offered to fully pay for it. However, the detective stated that it was pointless since they did not have a single suspect with whom to compare the obtained DNA profile. Meanwhile, John started a new family, but at some point he reunited with Stephanie. They planned to go to Hawaii together, but something unusual happened before that. The man called the detective and asked if they had any new evidence indicating Stephanie's involvement in the murder. Apparently, he himself suspected that the woman might have done something like that. However, all these years, he was afraid to talk about it, although this did not prevent him from sleeping with her again. As for Stephanie herself, she was quickly climbing the career ladder in the police department, she received higher ranks, twice became detective of the year, and had an impeccable reputation. She also married another police officer, but this did not prevent her from regularly sleeping with John. To work on unsolved murders. They were given Sherry's case along with thousands of similar cases and the detectives began sorting through them gradually. They briefly studied each case, trying to understand which ones had the greatest chance of being solved. For example, murders without any clues were pushed to the end of the queue and cases with DNA samples of possible suspects were marked as the most promising. Sherry's murder made it onto this list because among the evidence was a piece of cotton that could have contained the perpetrator's saliva left behind after a bite. Two years later detectives picked up the case and sent all available evidence to the laboratory. Due to high demand, they had to wait almost two years for the results until January 2005. Among the evidence were nail fragments and blood samples from the apartment. All of them contained only Sherry's DNA, and the forensic scientists only had to study the sample from the bite mark on her body. The problem was that they couldn't find the vial with this evidence for a whole day, until they finally discovered it by the wall of a large refrigerator. After studying the sample, experts found foreign DNA belonging to an unknown woman. This profile was immediately run through the FBI database, but it wasn't there. Detectives speculated that this woman could have committed the robbery with another criminal or two female robbers could have broken into Sherry's apartment. The investigators still believed that the murder occurred during a robbery therefore they didn't consider any other versions after they failed to find any new leads in this direction the case was put on hold discontinued until February 2009 when a new detective took up Sherry's case began studying the materials left by other investigators. Seeing that DNA from another woman was found at the bite mark on the victim's body, he questioned the robbery version. Detectives considered that the motives for this crime could be completely different, so they decided to compile a list of all the women who could potentially be related to Sherry's murder. As a result, they managed to collect five names. Among them was Stephanie, the victim's colleague at work, and three other young women. The detectives initially doubted Stephanie's involvement, considering her reputation and successful career in the police. For this reason, he first decided to check the other suspects. Together with other investigators, they fairly quickly concluded that three women from this list had no connection to Sherry's death. They lacked motives and had alibis. After that they began to investigate the nurse who worked with Sherry. The case file stated that they had rather tense relations and the police secretly obtained a sample of her DNA from the trash he threw away. Experts extracted the profile and found that it didn't match the saliva found at the bite mark location. Thus, the detectives had only one suspect left. Stephanie. He and several colleagues agreed to keep this information secret. Until they could obtain solid evidence or disprove this theory. None of them wanted to accuse a police officer with an impeccable reputation of murder, and Stephanie could easily ruin their careers using her connections. They began secretly gathering information on her, trying to find any connection to the murder. Interestingly, the woman worked in the same building on the same floor as them. The investigators had to take many precautions and not even mention her name in their notes. Soon the detectives discovered the first interesting fact. 
During the years of the murder, Stephanie owned a .38 caliber revolver, the same type of gun that was used to shoot Sherry. They also learned that the victim had repeatedly complained about strange and even aggressive behavior from Stephanie. In her uniform and said rude things to her seemed suspicious. Even more suspicion was added by the fact that Stephanie had broken into Sherry's gated community and even into her apartment several times. After analyzing the reports and photos from the crime scene, the detectives concluded that the possible robbery seemed staged. Nothing was taken from the apartment, not even the valuable items that were prominently displayed. But instead only a player and stereo were taken away. Moreover, the shooter had to be well-versed in how the gun worked. In extreme conditions, he was able to wrap the gun barrel with a blanket in such a way that the neighbors did not hear a single shot. It is unlikely that a low-level thief of players could possess such skills, but a trained and experienced police officer could. Another fact indicating Stephanie's involvement was a stolen marriage registration certificate found in her apartment. Why would some random burglars look for this document and take it with them, leaving a whole box of jewelry behind? But for Stephanie, it could have had a significant symbolic value. Perhaps killing Sherry was not enough for her, or she had planned to break into her apartment only for this document, but the woman caught her in the act. In the end, the detective learned that two weeks after the murder, Stephanie came to the police station and filed a report of theft. According to this information, someone had broken into her car, which was left near the pier and stolen several items, including a sports bag, clothes, videotapes, and a 38 caliber revolver. Given all the facts presented, the moment with the gun seemed very suspicious. Detectives suspected that she intentionally got rid of the weapon, disguising it as a theft. Furthermore, she filed a report at a different police station where nobody knew her, which seemed very strange since her colleagues would have taken the case with the utmost responsibility. As a result, the detectives decided to obtain a DNA sample from Stephanie. Several officers undercover followed her for a week until they finally had the opportunity to get it. On May 28, 2009, Stephanie and her stepdaughter stopped at a cafe for a snack. As soon as they left, the officers took the glass she drank from and sent it to the lab. The next day, the result was ready. A full match. Despite the many factors pointing to Stephanie's involvement, the detectives were still shocked. It was hard for them to believe that a high-ranking and respected police officer was connected to the murder. But the DNA results were indisputable. However, at that moment, they did not have time for these thoughts and investigators began developing a plan to arrest her. None of them wanted to do this in the middle of the police station in front of hundreds of officers. Moreover, Stephanie had extensive connections and the detectives decided to lure her away from prying eyes. The chief of the Los Angeles Police Department was unofficially informed. That one of his subordinates was suspected of the murder. The chief ordered the detectives not to approach Stephanie while she had her service or personal weapon with her. He also considered the idea of arresting her in her own home risky since she lived with her husband and stepdaughter. The detectives began to think about how to get the person who outranked them to surrender their weapon. And soon they had an excellent idea. In the basement of the police department, there were holding cells designed for temporary detention of criminals. So anyone entering there had to surrender their weapon. To lure her there, a legend was created. Stephanie had extensive experience working in the department that dealt with art thefts. Therefore, on June 5, 2009, two detectives with hidden microphones approached her and asked for help. They said they had arrested a suspect who may have some information about stolen paintings. The detectives admitted that they were not familiar with all the details and needed the help of an experienced professional. Stephanie agreed and went with them to the basement where the suspect was supposed to be held. After the woman surrendered her weapon, they went to the interrogation room, but there was no suspect there. Instead, the detectives gradually and very carefully laid out the cards on the table. Asking Stephanie questions about Sherry's murder. At first, they simply said that they needed to ask her a few questions about an old case related to her ex-boyfriend. Over the course of an hour, they smoothly led the dialogue to a discussion of the murder itself, but Stephanie said that she hardly remembered Sherry as it was all a long time ago. Finally, the detectives announced that they had obtained the killer's DNA and asked Stephanie to provide her DNA sample for comparison. 
At that point, the woman immediately said that she was not going to give her DNA, refused to talk further without a lawyer, and decided to leave. The detectives let her go, but several policemen with handcuffs were waiting for Stephanie at the end of the corridor. Twenty-three years after the murder, the woman was arrested, considering Stephanie's vast police experience all attempts to talk to her during interrogations led to no results. She knew the situation perfectly. There was DNA evidence against her, found at the bite mark on the victim's body, and it was extremely difficult to dispute this evidence. Nevertheless, she denied her involvement and insisted on her innocence. As a result, the detectives had no choice but to prepare documents for the transfer to court. Over the next few years, Stephanie was held in a woman's prison until the first hearings began in 2012. It took the police three years to basically rebuild the case from scratch. Because their predecessors blindly believed in a failed robbery, it was necessary to redo all the materials and focus specifically on Stephanie. After trial, the woman continued to insist on her innocence. Her lawyer questioned the DNA test results and also pointed out that there were no suspicions against Stephanie. During the initial investigation. But all these arguments turned out to be completely unconvincing. The prosecution believed that on that day, Stephanie waited for John to leave for work and entered Sherry's apartment. She went upstairs, shot Sherry once, but Sherry managed to resist and a struggle ensued, which moved downstairs. Ultimately, Stephanie killed her, staged a riot in the apartment, creating an illusion of a burglary. She then found a marriage certificate and left the scene. After her arrest, detectives discovered that Stephanie had boasted to colleagues about her lock-picking set and they found several books on how to pick locks in her home. This could explain how she entered the apartment without leaving any traces of a break-in. A lock of not the best quality can be picked with lock picks so that no expert will notice any traces. The trial ended on March 8, 2012. The jury found Stephanie guilty of murder. She received a sentence ranging from 27 years to life in prison, as well as an additional two years for using a service weapon. The judge deducted 1,000 days from her sentence, citing the time spent behind bars awaiting trial and her good behavior. Sherry's parents tried to sue the detectives who originally worked the case, despite the fact that the victim's father had been telling them to look at Stephanie from the very beginning. They ignored his words. This raises a reasonable question. Were they deliberately covering up their colleague or did they really not believe in her involvement? In the first case, it would have been a serious crime. And in the second case, it would have been simple negligence and ignoring significant facts. Unfortunately, the statute of limitations had expired in this case and the court refused to prosecute these police officers. As for Stephanie, she filed an appeal immediately after the trial, but it was quickly rejected. She still denies her guilt while behind bars. At present, she's 62 years old and can file a petition for early release only in 2039. Sherry's ex-husband, John, lost interest in investigating her murder. Almost immediately after it happened, he started a new family, slept with Stephanie for a while, and later moved to another city. Detectives questioned his involvement, but this version seems unlikely. Most likely, he did not know about his ex-wife's plans. Thus, this case could have been gathering dust in archives to this day if it hadn't fallen into the hands of professional detectives. Everyone who worked on it before refused to even consider the version of their colleagues' involvement. Share your opinion about this story in the comments, and don't forget to give a like if you enjoyed the video.